Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. The five revelations in this week's lesson were all received within a period of about six and a half weeks. All of them concern Oliver Cowdery and his calling as Joseph Smith's scribe during the translation of the Book of Mormon. Between the 1st of December, 1828 and the 27th of March, 1829, 22-year-old Oliver Cowdery, a school teacher from Vermont, contracted to teach at the Stafford Schoolhouse in Manchester Township, New York. During his 16-week stay, he boarded with the Joseph Smith Sr. family and learned of the gold plates and Joseph Smith Jr.'s efforts to translate them. Joseph Smith wrote, quote, The Lord appeared unto a young man by the name of Oliver Cowdery, and showed unto him the plates in a vision, and also the truth of the work, and what the Lord was about to do through me, his unworthy servant. Therefore, he was desirous to come and write for me." Unquote. Lucy Mack Smith, the prophet's mother, recalled that, quote, when the term of school, which he was then teaching, was closed, unquote, Oliver intended to go and pay Joseph a visit. Oliver told the Smith family, quote, I have now resolved what I will do for the thing which I told you seems working in my very bones, insomuch that I cannot for a moment get rid of it. I have made it a subject of prayer, and I firmly believe that it is the will of the Lord that I should go, and that there is a work for me to do in this thing, and I am determined, if there is, to attend to it." Unquote. Between the 1st and 5th of April, 1829, Oliver Cowdery and Samuel Smith, the prophet's brother, traveled from Manchester, New York to Harmony, Pennsylvania, a journey of about 125 miles or 200 kilometers. Along the way, Oliver stopped at the home of his friends, the family of Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, New York. Peter's son, David Whitmer, had heard many conflicting rumors about Joseph Smith and the gold plates, and Oliver promised that he would inform him of the results of his investigation. According to Joseph's mother, quote, two or three days before the arrival of Oliver and Samuel in Harmony, Joseph, feeling it his privilege to lay hold of the promise of the angel that the Lord would send him a scribe, called upon his heavenly father for the promised assistance and was informed that the same should be forthcoming in a few days. As soon after Oliver was introduced to him, he informed Joseph what his business was. He said, Mr. Smith, 
I have come for the purpose of writing for you. This was not at all expected to Joseph, for although he had never seen Mr. Cowdery before, he knew that the Lord was able to perform and that he had been faithful to fulfill all his promises. Unquote. Joseph Smith recalled, quote, two days after the arrival of Mr. Cowdery, being the 7th of April, I commenced to write the Book of Mormon, and he commenced to write for me, which, having continued for some time, I inquired of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim, and obtained the following revelation. Unquote. On or about the 6th of April, 1829, Joseph received a revelation directed to himself and Oliver Cowdery. This revelation is now section 6 in our Doctrine and Covenants. D&C 6, verses 1 and 2, quote, A great and marvelous work is about to come forth unto the children of men. Behold, I am God. Give heed unto my word, which is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, to the dividing asunder of both joints and marrow. Therefore, give heed unto my words." Unquote. In the scriptures, the word of God is often compared to a sword. The wording of verse 2 is drawn from a passage in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. King James Version. Quote, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Unquote. Quick, in this instance, means alive, living, as opposed to dead or unanimated. The sword referred to in both of these passages is not a one-handed foil or saber, but a long, heavy, two-handed broadsword that is sharpened on both edges. This kind of sword cuts both ways. Why use a sword as a metaphor for the Word of God? Latter-day Saint scholar John Twednes wrote, quote, The Word of God, like a sword, can be used in two different ways, as an offensive weapon that can wound or kill or as a defensive weapon to ward off blows from the enemy. If we ignore the word of God, it can destroy us, while if we obey his word, it can save us. For this reason, the Lord counsels us to take up the sword of my spirit, which I will pour out upon you, and my word, which I will reveal unto you. That passage paraphrases Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, which advises taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Both scriptures remind us that the Word of God comes through the Spirit to both prophets and others who need divine guidance. Just as a sword divides asunder both joints and marrow, so does the Word of God penetrate to the thoughts and intents of the heart." Unquote. In the same revelation, the Lord mentioned a gift that Oliver Cowdery possessed. D&C 6, verses 10 through 12, quote, Behold, thou hast a gift, and blessed art thou because of thy gift. Remember, it is sacred and cometh from above, and if thou wilt inquire, thou shalt know mysteries which are great and marvelous. Therefore, thou shalt exercise thy gift, that thou mayest find out mysteries, that thou mayest bring many to the knowledge of the truth, yea, convince them of the error of their ways. Make not thy gift known unto any, save it be those who are of thy faith. Trifle not with sacred things." Unquote. What was Oliver's gift? Back in Lesson 1, we discussed how Oliver may have possessed something tangible, similar to Joseph Searstone, that helped him exercise a spiritual gift he had. Oliver's calling was to be Joseph's scribe, to assist in the translation of the Book of Mormon, and to establish Zion. These were the same gifts that had originally been given to Martin Harris, who lost them through his carelessness and lack of faith. Joseph Smith's revelations frequently refer to gifts rather than talents or abilities. Perhaps this was the Lord's way of reminding Joseph and his associates where their abilities came from, 
that they were employed in the Lord's work and that they shouldn't boast in their own strength, behaviors in keeping with the theme of humility we discussed in the last lesson. In d &C 6, verse 13, Oliver also received the promise that if he would, quote, do good, yea, and hold out faithful to the end, thou shalt be saved in the kingdom of God, which is the greatest of all the gifts of God. For there is no gift greater than the gift of salvation." Unquote. What are the great and marvelous mysteries the Lord promised that Oliver would know? One Doctrine and Covenants commentary explains, quote, a mystery is a truth that cannot be known except through divine revelation, a sacred secret. In the days of Paul, the important truth that Gentiles were to be admitted to the kingdom of God without observing the law of Moses was a mystery. In our day, such great truths as those pertaining to the restoration of the priesthood, the work for the dead, and the reestablishment of the church are mysteries because they could not have been discovered except by revelation." Unquote. These mysteries are what the Word of Wisdom calls great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. When Section 6 was received in the spring of 1829, the contents of the Book of Mormon were a mystery, and many things we take for granted today as basic principles of the restored gospel were still mysteries to Oliver and Joseph. Joseph Smith advised, quote, all men and women to go on to perfection and search deeper and deeper into the mysteries of godliness." Unquote. We should, however, rightly discern between the mysteries of godliness and what we might call the vain mysteries, subjects that have not been revealed and about which it would be pointless and a distraction to speculate. How will many be brought to the knowledge of the truth and convinced of the error of their ways? Since this revelation is specifically about the translation and publication of the Book of Mormon, it seems to me that this would be accomplished through the publication of that great book. From a broader perspective, the restoration of the gospel would also fulfill this prophecy. In the section six revelation, Joseph also made known something that was known at that time only to Oliver and the Lord. DNC 6, verses 14 through 17 and 22 through 23. Quote, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Blessed art thou for what thou hast done, for thou hast inquired of me, and behold, as often as thou hast inquired, thou hast received instruction of my spirit, if it had not been so, thou wouldst not have come to the place where thou art at this time. Behold, thou knowest that thou hast inquired of me, and I did enlighten thy mind. And now I tell thee these things, that thou mayest know that thou hast been enlightened by the spirit of truth. Yea, I tell thee that thou mayest know that there is none else save God that knowest thy thoughts and the intents of thy heart. I tell thee these things as a witness unto thee that the words or the work which thou hast been writing are true. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know concerning the truth of these things. Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? Unquote. Joseph Smith recalled, quote, After we had received this revelation, he, Oliver Cowdery, stated to me that after he had gone to my father's to board, and after the family communicated to him concerning my having got the plates, that one night after he had retired to bed, he called upon the Lord to know if these things were so, and that the Lord had manifested to him that they were true, but that he had kept this circumstance entirely secret and had mentioned it to no being, so that after this revelation having been given, he knew that the work was true, because that no being living knew of the thing alluded to in the revelation, but God and himself." Unquote. 
In this first revelation to Oliver Cowdery, the Lord also held out the promise of an even greater role that he could play. DNC 6, verses 25 through 28. Quote, and behold, I grant unto you a gift, if you desire of me, to translate, even as my servant Joseph. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that there are records which contain much of my gospel, which have been kept back because of the wickedness of the people. And now I command you, that if you have good desires, a desire to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven, then shall you assist in bringing to light with your gift those parts of my scriptures which have been hidden because of iniquity. And now behold, I give unto you, and also unto my servant Joseph, the keys of this gift, which shall bring to light this mystery, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established." Unquote. Joseph related that shortly after this promise was given, quote, Oliver Cowdery became exceedingly anxious to have the power to translate bestowed upon him, and in relation to this desire, the following revelations were obtained." Unquote. These two revelations are now sections 8 and 9. Section 8 was received on or about the 9th of April, 1829. DNC 8, verses 1 through 3, quote, Oliver Cowdery, verily, verily, I say unto you, that assuredly as the Lord liveth, who is your God and your Redeemer, even so surely shall you receive a knowledge of whatsoever things you shall ask in faith with an honest heart, believing that you shall receive a knowledge concerning the engravings of old records, which are ancient, which contain those parts of my scripture, of which have been spoken by the manifestation of my spirit. Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you, and which shall dwell in your heart. Now, behold, this is the spirit of revelation. Behold, this is the spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground." Unquote. Oliver tried to translate and failed. After his failure, Joseph received another revelation on or about the 26th of April, 1829, that explained why Oliver had been unable to translate from the gold plates. DNC 9, verses 7 through 9, quote, Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you, when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. But behold, I say unto you, that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. But if it be not right, you shall have no such feelings but you shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. Therefore, you cannot write that which is sacred, save it be given you from me." Unquote. In these two revelations, the Lord revealed to Oliver how the Holy Ghost communicates with us. This fundamental principle was perhaps the most critical doctrine that could be revealed at the commencement of the Restoration, because it is the key to learning truths from God. Several key words in these three revelations identify how the Holy Ghost communicates with us. God will enlighten thy mind by the spirit of truth. He will speak peace to your mind. He will tell you in your mind and in your heart. Oliver was commanded to study it out in your mind, then ask me if it be right. He was told, your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. He was further told, if it be not right, you shall have a stupor of thought. Notice that the mind is mentioned five times in these passages, and the heart, or feelings, are mentioned twice. Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, We do not have the words, even the scriptures do not have the words, which perfectly describe the spirit. The scriptures generally use the word voice, which does not exactly fit. These delicate, refined spiritual communications are not seen with our eyes, nor heard with our ears. And even though it is described as a voice, it is a voice that one feels more than one hears. 
Once I came to understand this, one verse in the Book of Mormon took on a profound meaning, and my testimony of the book increased immeasurably. It had to do with Laman and Lemuel, who rebelled against Nephi. Nephi rebuked them and said, Ye have seen an angel, and he spake unto you. Yea, you have heard his voice from time to time, and he hath spoken unto you in a still small voice. But ye were past feeling that ye could not feel his words. The voice of the Spirit is described in the scripture as being neither loud nor harsh. It is not a voice of thunder, neither voice of a great tumultuous noise, but rather a still voice of perfect mildness as if it had been a whisper, and it can pierce even to the very soul and cause the heart to burn. Remember, Elijah found the voice of the Lord was not in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but was a still, small voice. The Spirit does not get our attention by shouting or shaking us with a heavy hand. Rather, it whispers. It caresses so gently that if we are preoccupied, we may not feel it at all. No wonder that the word of wisdom was revealed to us, for how could the drunkard or the addict feel such a voice? Occasionally, it will press just firmly enough for us to pay heed, but most of the time, if we do not heed the gentle feeling, the Spirit will withdraw and wait until we come seeking and listening and say in our manner and expression, like Samuel of ancient times, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Unquote. The Lord works with both the mind, our intellect, and the heart, our emotions. Revelation is not just emotion, but neither is it purely intellect. It is a combination of both working together. Those who insist on only trusting their intellect to learn spiritual truths will never come to a full and complete witness. They may learn many truths, but they will never be able to testify from the heart that they are true. One persistent misconception held by both those in and out of the church is that the impressions of the Holy Ghost are just feelings or only an emotional experience. Critics of the restored gospel complain that the saint's description of a burning in the bosom is subjective and based on emotion, and it is thus unreliable and susceptible to self-deception. They belittle our descriptions of spiritual experiences, comparing them to warm fuzzies. This misconception may come from over-reading DNC 9 verses 8 and 9. The experience of burning in the bosom was given specifically to Oliver Cowdery in relation to his attempt to translate the Book of Mormon. That spiritual experience may have wider application, but I personally think that some Latter-day Saints rely too much or solely on that one manifestation. The feelings produced by the Holy Spirit are an important part of a spiritual witness, but they are only a part. I myself have been overcome with emotion when listening to a beautiful piece of music or watching a touching moment in a movie. But while the Spirit of the Lord may invoke those same feelings, it also communicates what the prophet Joseph called pure intelligence, while music and film often do not. Emotion alone doesn't teach us anything about God and his kingdom. The Holy Spirit, however, can and does teach us. I have personally had scores of experiences, including while reading the scriptures, participating in meetings or conversations, and participating in temple ordinances, where the Spirit has enlightened me. These are what I call aha moments, during which new ideas and new understandings come upon me suddenly, accompanied by a witness from the Spirit that they are true. That is communication from the Holy Ghost. Then Elder Dallin H. Oaks wrote, quote, what does a burning in the bosom mean? Does it need to be a feeling of caloric heat, like the burning produced by combustion? If that is the meaning, I have never had a burning in the bosom. Surely the word burning in the scripture signifies a feeling of comfort and serenity. That is the witness many receive. That is the way revelation works." Unquote. In an address to religious educators, President Howard W. Hunter cautioned, quote, 
I get concerned when it appears that strong emotion or free-flowing tears are equated with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Certainly, the Spirit of the Lord can bring strong emotional feelings, including tears, but that outward manifestation ought not be confused with the presence of the Spirit itself. I have watched a great many of my brethren over the years, and we have shared some rare and unspeakable spiritual experiences together. Those experiences have all been different, each special in its own way, and such sacred moments may or may not be accompanied by tears. Very often they are, but sometimes they are accompanied by total silence. Other times they are accompanied by joy. Always they are accompanied by a great manifestation of the truth, of revelation to the heart." Unquote. On or about the 21st of May, 1829, the prophet Joseph received a revelation concerning John, the New Testament apostle. Joseph described the circumstances of the revelation this way, quote, during the month of April, I continued to translate, and he, Oliver, to write with little cessation, during which time we received several revelations. A difference of opinion arising between us about the account of John the Apostle mentioned in the New Testament, John 21st chapter and 22nd verse, whether he died or whether he continued. We mutually agreed to settle it by the Urim and Thummim, and the following is the word which we received. Unquote. This revelation expands on an enigmatic passage at the end of the Gospel of John. John 21, verses 21 through 23, King James Version. Quote, Peter, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Unquote. Joseph's revelation was a translation of a parchment written by the Apostle John. It may have been part of John's original gospel, or perhaps a separate account. Although Joseph never actually had this parchment in his possession, he referred to this revelation as a translation. This has important implications for Joseph's new translation of the Bible. We'll discuss these in Lesson 15. From this revelation and other teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, we learn the Apostle John currently lives on the earth in a translated state. Like the three Nephite disciples, he has not died and been resurrected. Rather, he has been raised from a telestial to a terrestrial body. When the Savior returns in glory, John will die and be resurrected in the twinkling of an eye. John was to prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. According to Joseph Smith, John's mission is to gather the tribes of Israel, and, quote, John the Revelator was then among the ten tribes of Israel who had been led away by Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion to again possess the land of their fathers. The apostles Peter, James, and John hold the keys of the first presidency, and these three bestowed them upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, something we'll discuss in the next lesson. The final revelation we'll review in this lesson is Joseph Smith's account of the words spoken by the resurrected John the Baptist as he ordained Joseph and Oliver Cowdery to the Aaronic priesthood on the 15th of May, 1829. In 1838, Joseph dictated the account of this event for the Manuscript History of the Church. An extract of that account is in Joseph Smith History in the Pearl of Great Price. In 1876, the words spoken by John the Baptist were added to the Doctrine and Covenants as Section 13. In September 1834, Oliver Cowdery documented his recollection of this event and a letter he wrote to William W. Phelps. Oliver's account is included as a footnote to Joseph Smith History, verse 71. Joseph recalled in 1838, quote, We still continued the work of translation, when in the ensuing month, 
May 1829, we on a certain day went into the woods to pray and inquire of the Lord respecting baptism for the remission of sins, as we found mentioned in the translation of the plates. Unquote. Joseph continued, quote, While we were thus employed, praying and calling upon the Lord, a messenger from heaven descended in a cloud of light, and having laid his hands upon us, he ordained us, saying unto us, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels, and of the gospel of repentance, and a baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth, until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. He said this Aaronic priesthood had not the power of laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that this should be conferred upon us hereafter. And he commanded us to go and be baptized and gave us directions that I should baptize Oliver Cowdery and afterward that he should baptize me. Accordingly, we went and were baptized. I baptized him first and afterwards he baptized me, after which I laid my hands upon his head and ordained him to the Aaronic priesthood, and afterward he laid his hands on me and ordained me to the same priesthood, for so we were commanded. The messenger who visited us on this occasion and conferred this priesthood upon us said that his name was John, the same that is called John the Baptist in the New Testament, that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which priesthood, he said, should in due time be conferred upon us, and that I should be called the first elder of the church, and he the second. It was on the 15th of May, 1829, that we were baptized and ordained under the hand of the messenger. Immediately upon our coming up out of the water after we had been baptized, we experienced great and glorious blessings from our Heavenly Father. No sooner had I baptized Oliver Cowdery than the Holy Ghost fell upon him, and he stood up and prophesied many things which should shortly come to pass. And again, so soon as I had been baptized by him, I also had the spirit of prophecy. When standing up, I prophesied concerning the rise of this church and many other things connected with the church and this generation of the children of men. We were filled with the Holy Ghost and rejoiced in the God of our salvation. Our minds being now enlightened, we began to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings and the true meaning and intention of their more mysterious passages revealed unto us in a manner which we never could attain to previously, nor ever before had thought of." Unquote. Let's examine John the Baptist's ordination prayer, beginning with his opening phrase, Upon you, my fellow servants. In an address to priesthood holders, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, quote, It is interesting to me that John spoke to Joseph and Oliver when they were both young men and they were not highly regarded by people of the world as his fellow servants. He did not speak down to them as a king might speak to one of his subjects. He did not speak down to them as a judge might speak to an individual on trial before him. He did not speak down to them as a university president or a high school principal might speak to his students. Rather, he was he who was a resurrected being addressed these young men as his fellow servants. To me, there is something wonderful in this. It speaks of the true spirit of the great and magnificent brotherhood of which we are all a part, the priesthood of God. We are all servants together, regardless of our position in the church or in the world, regardless of wealth or lack of it, regardless of the color of our skin, we are all servants together, brothers one to another and sons of God as part of this great body of sacred priesthood." Unquote. In the name of Messiah, John used the English form of the Hebrew title Mashiach, which is equivalent to the Greek Christos, both of which mean anointed one. I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. It's important to note that the terms Aaronic and Melchizedek 
were not used in connection with the priesthood until at least December 1834. The prophet used the expression Aaronic priesthood based on his understanding in 1838 of what had happened in 1829. In his September 1834 recollection of this event, Oliver Cowdery quoted John the Baptist as saying, quote, I confer this priesthood and this authority, unquote. We'll discuss this in more detail in the next lesson, and when we review the concepts of priesthood authority and priesthood keys in more detail in Lesson 18. What does the keys of the ministering of angels mean? Should we understand that term literally or figuratively? Then Elder Dallin H. Oaks taught, quote, what does it mean that the Aaronic priesthood holds the key of the ministering of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism and the remission of sins? The meaning is found in the ordinance of baptism and in the sacrament. Baptism is for the remission of sins, and the sacrament is a renewal of the covenants and blessings of baptism. Both should be preceded by repentance. When we keep the covenants we made in these ordinances, we are promised that we will always have his spirit to be with us. The ministering of angels is one of the manifestations of that spirit." Unquote. President Gordon B. Hinckley said in the same priesthood session of General Conference that I cited a moment ago, quote, think of it, my dear young brethren, this priesthood which you hold carries with it the keys of the ministering of angels. That means, as I interpret it, that if you live worthy of the priesthood, you have the right to receive and enjoy the very power of heavenly beings to guide you, to protect you, to bless you." Unquote. President Wilford Woodruff testified, quote, a priest holds the keys of the ministering of angels. Never in my life, as an apostle, as a seventy, or as an elder, have I ever had more of the protection of the Lord than while holding the office of a priest. The Lord revealed to me by visions, by revelations, and by the Holy Spirit, many things that lay before me." Unquote. I believe that many Aaronic priesthood holders have the divine assistance of angels without realizing it. The Book of Mormon describes a group of Lamanites who were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. In a revelation to Joseph Smith, the Lord promised, I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts, and mine angels round about you to bear you up. And this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. This passage echoes a prophecy of the Old Testament prophet Malachi. Malachi 3, verses 2 through 4, King James Version. Quote, but who may abide the day of the Lord's coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years." Unquote. The sons of Levi refers to the descendants of the tribe of Levi, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Levites were the only tribe in Israel that held the priesthood, which is why the Aaronic priesthood is also called the Levitical priesthood in the Lord's revelations to Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith expanded on this subject, quote, as it is generally supposed that sacrifice was entirely done away when the great sacrifice was offered up and that there will be no necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in future, but those who assert this are certainly not acquainted with the duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood or with the prophets. The offering of sacrifice has ever been connected and forms a part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood and will be continued until after the coming of Christ from generation to generation. 
we frequently have mention made of the offering of sacrifice by the servants of the Most High in ancient days prior to the Law of Moses, which ordinances will be continued when the priesthood is restored with all its authority, power, and blessings. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built and the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored and attended to. All their powers, ramifications, and blessings, this ever did and will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restitution of all things spoken of by all the holy prophets be brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and variety of ceremonies. This never has been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued. It may be asked by some what necessity for sacrifice, since the great sacrifice was offered, an answer to which, if repentance and baptism and faith existed prior to the days of Christ, what necessity for them since that time? Unquote. Joseph was not explicit in this statement as to what the nature of that sacrifice would be. Some Latter-day Saints have speculated that, at some future time, there will be a restoration of blood sacrifice conducted by priests of the tribe of Levi. That is one possible interpretation of Joseph Smith's words, but I don't think it's the only interpretation, or even the best one. Joseph taught that the principle of sacrifice is eternal, connected to the priesthood, and predates the Law of Moses. The sacrifices done by the pre-Mosaic priesthood holders, he said, will be brought back when the temple is brought back. The temple Joseph was referring to was the Nauvoo Temple, which was under construction when he gave this address in October 1840. Joseph connected the completion of this temple to the purification of the sons of Levi and the restoration of ancient principles. It's my belief that the law of sacrifice Joseph referred to in 1840, and which John the Baptist mentioned in his ordination of Joseph and Oliver in 1829, is the same law that we covenant to observe in the temple endowment, which endowment was first given in Nauvoo when the temple was nearing its completion. There are instructions in the endowment about what this law entails, and it does not include a restitution of blood or animal sacrifice. We, as a church, are now striving to offer an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. This is, in part, accomplished through the weekly administration of the sacrament by priests of the Aaronic priesthood to the saints in over 30,000 wards and branches around the world. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In the next lesson, we'll discuss Joseph's other early revelations to his friends and family members and the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. The reading is sections 4, 11 through 12, 14 through 16, and 18 through 19. See you next week.